Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Getty Online Speaker Series for Teachers entitled Art-Based Mini Mindful Moments for Classroom Management with Erica Curtis. I'm Darcy Beeman Black, and I will be your host today. Over the next hour, art therapist Erica Curtis will show how the powerhouse combination of art and mindfulness can improve students' relationships, behaviors, and attention spans at school. We hope that you will gain immediately applicable, time-efficient, and effective art space strategies to easily bring many mindful moments to your learning spaces. Before I invite our speaker, I would like to share a little bit about why we are so excited to have her with us today. I met Erica during a workshop Getty Education hosted for teachers and school counselors in 2019, and everyone involved found her presentation to be super helpful and useful. The attendees reported that they absolutely loved the tools and concepts that Erica shared and that they plan to use them right away with students. I am so thrilled that we can share her ideas and wisdom once more. I also want to share a little bit about Erica's career. So Erica is a licensed marriage and family therapist and board certified art therapist with a private practice in Southern California. She is an award-winning author and consultant on creative approaches to well-being. Her books include The Innovative Parent, Raising Connected, Happy, Successful Kids Through Art, and Art Therapy for Kids, 75 Evidence-Based Art Projects to Improve Behavior, Build Social Skills, and Boost Emotional Resilience. Erica has been cited in over a hundred media outlets and we are so excited to have her with us. So now that you've heard about her, I would like to formally invite Erica to the online space and we'll pass the virtual stage over to her now. Thank you so much, Darcy. I'm so pleased to be here. Um, I have my hands in a lot of different projects and I have the, the privilege of doing a lot of different things, but I must say teaching these workshops is one of my absolute favorite. Um, it, is, it is such a like bucket filler for me to know that I'm sharing uh, my um, tools with folks who are helping folks. And I just feel, feel that sort of, you know, like that growth of helpers, helping helpers, helping helpers, helping helpers, right? And it just sort of spreads. And that's just such um, a meaningful space for me to be in. So thank you everybody for being here today. I'm gonna move right into my PowerPoint now and uh, talk a little bit about what we'll be going over this evening together. Um, I'm going to be presenting four different mini mindful activities that will be accessible, efficient <laughs> in terms of time efficiency, energy efficiencies, those things are important as educators. Um, and also, um, I hope you'll experience for yourself this evening effective. Um, I'm also going to be talking about the powerhouse combination of art and mindfulness, mindfulness being um, in its most basic sense, um, an awareness of whatever is happening in the present um, with a non judgmental stance, right? So, non judgmental awareness of the present, okay? And we can talk about bringing compassion to that, and there's other elements, but I think that's a helpful working definition of mindfulness non judgmental awareness of the present, all right? And then we'll talk about some practicalities in terms of um, using art uh, in your classroom or in your setting in order to help regulate students, to bring more social and emotional um, calm, awareness, teaching some skills, and how that fits into a day when you have a lot of other demands and curriculum um, to get to um, and behaviors to manage and things like that. Okay, and then we're also going to have a Q&A at the end. So if you do have questions that come up during this presentation, feel free um, to uh, use the Q&A uh, function to share your questions and we'll get to those at the end. So we're going to dive right into actually experiencing these because we can talk about them, but I think it's such a different experience to actually have hands on and to see what these activities are like for ourselves. Um, if you haven't already, I invite you to grab some materials. They can be art supplies. They can be office supplies. Um, it doesn't take more than a post-it note or a piece of computer paper. Um, or a notepad. I have some pens here. You can grab a pencil. So really, really simple supplies that we're working with here, uh, which is what helps to make it so 
um, efficient and sort of in the moment if you need to grab something uh, in the classroom that your students are probably all going to have a piece of paper and some kind of writing utensil. So again, I invite you to do that now so that you can participate and experience these activities for yourself. And now with a lot of these activities, I invite you to bring your own creativity to it and think about how would I apply this in my setting? Um, are my students challenged with stress? Are they challenged by distractions? Are they really high energy? Um, and so we can take this initial de-stress scribble and scramble, and maybe what we might do instead of scribbling out stress is scribble out our distractions or scribble out our energy. So I just invite you to be mindful of um, different ways you can adapt even the wording of the instructions to your particular population or setting or um, the kids that you're working with uh, this particular school year, all right? So for ourselves right now, I'm going to invite you to just think Think about some kind of mild stressor. It's the end of the day. It maybe is just where you're arriving right now. Maybe there's been a lot of energy just getting to the point where you can open your computer and log into this webinar. Or maybe there is something very specific that happened earlier in the day or earlier in the week that you feel some mild stress about. And whenever you're ready, I'm going to invite you to take your drawing or writing utensil and to start to scribble. Okay, so we're just going to scribble the stress. What would that stress look like if it started to take on a form, all right? And it might be small and tight, or it might be spiky, or it might fill up the entire page. However, you would like to de-stress scribble right now is completely up to you, all right? So I'm going to give you a moment to go ahead and do that. And while you're doing that, I am going to point out on several of these slides, um, you will see instructions here on the left-hand corner, the de-stress Scribble Unscramble. Um, this is a page from my most recent book that Darcy mentioned, Art Therapy Activities for Kids. So that's where that's coming from. All right, just so that you have that reference. All right, so go ahead and continue to scribble. And I invite you to, a lot of times adults are very sort of dainty in their scribbles. They just kind of like, ooh, do, 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 which is fine if that's how your stress is feeling and how it wants to move out. And it's also okay to really get in there. Sometimes when I invite adults to like really feel that stress and really let it scribble out, they that permission allows them to really, oh, okay, I can, I can really get it out now. So however you want to play with that movement, and if you'd even like to bring some attention with that mindfulness of attention to the present, what that feels like to move your hand in different directions or your arms, right? Are you just moving your fingers? Are you moving your whole hand? Are you moving your whole arm? And just take a moment now to notice what that movement feels like. All right. So whenever you're ready, um, you can stop. Right? If you're still scribbling, that's fine too, right? Some people want to scribble a little bit longer than others. And once you are satisfied with your scribble, we're going to take a look at it. So I invite you to hold it up, maybe, you know, hold it away from you, turn it around, and we're going to start to look for patterns or shapes or pictures in that scribble. So I liken it to looking for pictures in the clouds, right? So see if any images start to emerge. And then using your writing or drawing materials, or if you have any other colors, you're welcome to use those now as well. We're going to start to bring that image out. So you're going to embellish your scribble, right, so that we can start to see the image that's emerging. So we're going to transform this scribble into something new. Now, if you don't see an image, that's okay, too. You can color in the shapes. You can draw patterns. Right? You can trace over lines if you'd like to. And so you can create something more abstract. So I'm going to give you a moment to do that as well as you start to transform or unscramble your scribble. And I invite you while you're doing this unscrambling or this transformation piece is to also notice what's happening on the inside. Right? So through all these activities, we can invite our students to notice not just what they're making, but how they're feeling or what they're experiencing on the inside. So what's happening to your thoughts? What's happening to your feelings? What's happening with your sensations in this moment as you're starting to unscramble your scribble? Okay, and in just a moment, I'm going to invite you to use the chat bar. 
I'm sure many of you are still working on this and need more time. That's perfectly fine. Feel free to take some more time with this. Whenever you're ready, I'm going to invite you to use the chat bar to put one, two, or three words that describes what this process was like for you, what you noticed while you were doing this scribble and scramble. And I want to let you know too, and this is important to let our students know or any children that we work with that any experience is okay. Because while some people might find it relaxing or calming or insightful or fun or playful, other people might find it more stressful or anxiety producing, just depending on what's going on in their life at the moment, right? So it's okay to invite those remarks as well. I'm just going to take a look at the chat bar now and see if anybody's had a chance to. Um, one person sees a bird flying from a nest. I began to tune things out around me. I'm feeling more focused, feeling release. Frantic and frenzy became more calm circles. High stress, relaxing, just letting go. Frustrated, release. Calm, focus, body relaxed, relaxed, calming. I see a lot of circles. Yes. So much tension, I can feel the tension release. Thank you so much for all these remarks. So some of what's happening too is this is a very, what we would call like a kinesthetic uh, drawing activity. We're moving some of that energy out through the motion of the hand or the arm, right? And so there's a lot of different layers happening here. <clears throat> we're acknowledging a stress, we're giving form to it. So we're accessing something in, our in ourselves <clears throat> and we're putting it outside of ourselves, right? Which can be helpful in terms of giving an object to something that feels just kind of like ugh, inside of us. And now we can see it and get distance. And the process we use to do that is a lot of energy. We're moving that energy through our arm, right? <clears throat> and then once we take a look at it, we can feel empowered to then transform this stress. And sometimes what comes out of that are new insights, right? Okay, I'm gonna move on. So I came across this comic and I just thought it was such a accurate <laughs> representation of what so many people experience when they're feeling all jumbly or overwhelmed or stressed in here and just, you know, and even just moving some of that frantic energy out, right? And it's interesting, even that middle drawing, it, to me, I read that visually as like starting kind of slowly and then, all right, picking up that speed, right? <sighs> and then being able to what we call um, externalize it, right? We take something on the inside and we put it on the outside, right? So this has a lot to do with the powerhouse combo of art and mindfulness. It's important to understand what's happening when we are in the presence of challenging behaviors, you know, what we might call a challenging behavior, which often looks like acting out or acting inwards, right? Which could be withdraw, avoidance, or acting out, being very talkative or goofy, um, aggressive, right? Those are some acting out behaviors that we might see. Um, and then if we can understand these behaviors really as functional protectors um, <clears throat> that are helping a child to cope with um, a stressful situation. And when I say the word stress, I use that very broadly, right? We might be working with students who are experiencing um, acute or chronic trauma. Um, we might be working with children who are stressed from just the pressures of um, family conflict, or I don't want to say just, but from, you know, from the pressures of family conflict, from the pressures of a test. Uh, and we might be working with students who have learning disabilities, uh, ADHD, uh, whose uh, just experience of being in the presence of academics can feel very triggering to them. So what happens is the fear center activity in our brain increases, our ability to think decreases, right? When we're, on, when we're under stress, which means that it's harder to access our own language, it's harder to process other people's language, it's harder to learn, pay attention, and it's also harder to regulate our own emotions. Right. So when we're trying to talk to children, um, which I also use broadly to include adolescents, right, children and teens, 
and also adults, frankly, I mean, this applies to adults, we're talking about students today, but this applies to all of us. And we're trying to talk to somebody who's under a great deal of stress or having a stress reaction to something. Uh, and the brain's really not set up in those moments to process that information, think through what's going on, problem solve and change their behavior, right? So that's where mindful art comes in, really helpful. Now, art making alone, there's a lot of different ways that we can use art making to help children to regulate their behaviors by understanding what they're feeling, giving them alternative way to express themselves or communicate. Being mindful specifically brings in that sort of calming, centered, present, non-judgmental space internally. And so that's what we're gonna be focusing on today. So again, even though there's a lot of different ways that we can use our, for example, like emojis, I often use that. Like, I wonder how you're feeling right now, right? Today, we're gonna to really focus on that, helping kids shift their state internally through present centered, non-judgmental art making so that once their state experience shifts, and when I mean, when I say state experience, I mean like their body, right? That they can feel calmer on the inside. So then the brain receives messages, oh, I'm okay. I can re-engage, I can refocus, right? And some of you shared with that last activity that you were feeling more focused even after doing that, right? So we can see how all of these pieces are intertwined and how they come together. So what's fascinating to me is that even when our thinking and language and learning and attention goes offline, our sensory systems are staying online, right? And so we can access our internal world through the arts. Now today we're focusing on visual arts. Some of you might be um, ceramicists or writers or um, uh, you know drama therapists, music, um, you know musicians. Um, you know, there's a whole range. So I also invite you to think about different ways you might adapt these or layer on with your art modalities with writing or movement or a sound, right? Um, that we can layer onto these activities. So there's a lot of overlap between mindfulness and the art, both allow us to focus, slow down, connect with ourselves, accept things non-judgmentally. Now that doesn't inherently happen with art. A lot of you may have had the experience of creating art before and having your internal critic being very active around art making. It's actually um, sort of ironically a very fruitful place for the inner critic to speak up. Um, so it's also a very fruitful place for us to practice these mindful skills of observing when we're being critical of ourselves and then trying to shift our focus again, right? So that's something to be aware of and to speak with students about that if you hear your thoughts telling you that it's not good or it doesn't look right, right? What kinds of things can you practice? Reassuring yourself, that's not what this project's about. It doesn't matter how it looks. Um, or shifting focus. Oh, thank you, brain, for having that thought. I'm going to pay attention to how my arm feels as it's moving right now, because I'm going to keep making this rainbow, and this feels calming to me, right? So we can talk about different skills um, to refocus the thoughts, and this is a really um, useful place, a very sort of low stakes place where students can practice these skills, right? As I described before, also making art separates us from our thoughts and our feelings. We create an object and mindfulness does the same. We become the observing self. And we know through a lot of research that when we practice observing how we're feeling or how we're being in a moment, we're strengthening the parts of our brain that can help to regulate our emotions, right? It also helps us with tolerating um, distress, self-reflection, intention. So there's just lots and lots of good nutrients coming out of this combination of art and mindfulness. And mindfulness supports the arts in that, like I was saying, art can be a place where we become judgmental. So when we add that sort of background of being mindful of the thoughts happening while we're making art, we have this powerhouse combination um, that can be incredibly supportive. All right, so here's some of that brain stuff that I was just starting to talk a little bit about, right? There's fabulous research that looks at um, the part of the, the brain that's tasked with assessing threat, fight, flight, emotion, um, can actually shrink 
over time in a healthy, positive way. It becomes less active. Um, our prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for thinking, planning, organizing, and helping to regulate our emotions starts to thicken. And the connections between the prefrontal cortex and the emotional part of the brain um, start to strengthen as well. And these are um, connections that you know, develop a lot later in um, young adulthood, actually in early 20s, we start to see more of these connections and we start to see the strengthening of these connections later. So we can do these activities to help over time um, to eventually allow the prefrontal cortex, the, what we can call like the thinking brain, um, to regulate lower brain activity, which is that survival brain activity. So that ultimately we see more thoughtful responses replacing stressful reactions, right? And so you can sort of see how each of these goes in turn. And that is simply by pro providing opportunities for students to observe their own experiences, observe how they're feeling on the inside, learning how to shift their states um, using these tools and then reflecting on that, right? Now this of course doesn't, all these brain changes don't happen with one time, it happens over time. However, you're really gonna be laying the, the groundwork um, for them to understand these are things that they can use not only in the classroom when you facilitate them, but hopefully they'll go home and start using these things in, in their homes, um, you know, on the bus ride, you know, wherever they are. Um, and I'll talk a little bit later, there's some activities that you don't even need a paper and pencil. Well, I'll say right now, even with the de-stress scribble, unscramble, right? There we go, right? Just the finger in the air. Let's pretend we have a piece of paper and a pen and we're just gonna scribble, right? Or we can just scribble real small like this, right? And so there's lots of different ways we can quickly adapt to not even use materials, right? So translating all of this brain research into sort of a creative image on the left here, essentially the way I look to, like to think of it is that when we are creative and curious, which is what having that artist mindset and a mindful mindset invites is curiosity, right? And we are compassionate towards ourselves and others, we strengthen and, and broaden our zone of regulation. So our bandwidth to be able to tolerate discomfort, distress, and to be able to come back into it and rebound and have that resiliency to come back into it more quickly. So we're gonna dive into another activity now um, called Mindful Mountains. Um, this helps with um, focus, self-awareness, um, Again, inviting you to think about different ways that you can apply it. It can be used for relaxation. Um, I mentioned that here in the slide. Um, it can also be used though to kind of get an assessment as an educator, right? Maybe beginning of the day, maybe end of the day, see how your students are feeling that day coming into the classroom. So this can also give you some good information about what's walking in your door in the, mor in the, in the morning. And you could even start a, a ritual starting your day with a mindful mountain, for example. So the way we're going to do a mindful mountain is by bringing your writing utensil or drawing utensil onto your paper. Now, if you want a real challenge, you're going to not look at your paper. So if you feel comfortable, you can close your eyes. If you would rather leave them open, that's fine. If you really, really, really want to look at your paper, that's fine too, right? So you can kind of gauge. Some people get anxious when they're instructed to not look at their paper, which is why it's useful to give people a lot of different options. And some kids really like the challenge of not looking at their paper, and that's going to be really motivating for them. And what we're going to do is bring our attention to our breath as it goes in and out. And we're going to not try to control our breath, but just observe our breath, how it is, and start to think about it as mountains. So we go inhale and exhale, right? And as we do that, we're gonna to start to draw this landscape, this mountainscape of our breath by going in and out. So that inhale creates an incline and the exhale creates the decline on the other side of the mountain. And that very next exhale or inhale rather creates the next incline. And that exhale then creates the other side of the mountain. So mountains might be taller than other mountains. You might have a steep incline and then a short decline, right? And so again, not having to control or change, although your breath may change on its own. Once you get to the end of the page, 
uh, to your paper, you are welcome to pick up your pen and create a second mountain range below or above your first and repeat it. And you can do that as many times as you would like to. And I'm just going to give you a moment to do that with some quiet. And again, just inviting you to observe whatever happens on the inside. So noticing your breath, checking back in with your thoughts, any emotions, any sensations. <clears throat> now, if you're really having a great time making your mountain range and you were just in the mountain range groove right now, feel free to just fill your whole page with mountain ranges. <clears throat> if you've done one or two and you say, that's enough, I'm good. Right. And the next step, if you have time and, and for some people and in some situations, that might be enough. You invite your students to title their drawing and you put it away for another time to add to it. Right. If you have the time and you want to layer on to this, this is where that sort of additional piece of, of emotional awareness can come in. We can invite students to think about how they're feeling today, what their mood is. And we can talk about moods like weather. Right? Um, are you feeling stormy? Are you feeling sunny? Are you feeling rainy? Are you feeling windy? Are you feeling snowy? Whatever that means to you. Are you feeling like a rainbow today? Right? And then we can invite our students to decorate their mountain ranges or their hills or, or if they want it to be a seascape and those are the ocean waves, that's fine too. Right? And so now they can start to embellish it and add to it. So I'm going to invite you to do that now if you'd like to. So just think about your general mood. And what kind of a scene would you create out of your mindful mountains? Would you like to add plants or animals, weather, rivers, grass, snow? This image here that you see in the slide, this was actually created by, my, um, by one of my children. I have three children. This was done by my six-year-old. Um, and we actually collaborated a little bit on it. You, you may experience this at times where a student, you know, uh, okay, I'm done, <laughs> right? Um, and they don't seem like they're being very mindful. <laughs> uh, I'm done, right? Um, so I gave my son a little bit of support here and, and just checked in with him and said, well, you know, like, what, what, what might, how are you, you know, like, what's your mood? And we talked about the weather and he said, well, I'm feeling sunny. And I said, well, how would you like to show that? And so then he drew the suns inside each mountain. And then he started doing the grass. And he goes, this is a lot of grass. And he said, will you help me? And so I said, sure. So I started on the other side. And so then it became sort of a nice social connection activity for us because I helped him and then we met in the middle. Um, and then once we did that, um, he went back and added all the flowers on, on the top, right? So we think about different um, children will need different levels of support with some of these activities. And so we can think creatively also about the um, emotional and social skills opportunities, um, you know, with the arts to even do something as simple as, you know, is there something that I can help you with, you know, not to take over it and not to go over and draw on another child's drawing if it hasn't been invited, um, but that there are social skills or connective opportunities um, to um, bring into these activities as well. All right, so again, using the chat bar, I'm inviting you to uh, put one, two or three words that described what you noticed during this activity. Feel free to add any challenges or discomforts. If anything felt a little, eh, right? Again, that's part of the human experience too. Lovely, more aware. Apparently I'm in a foul mood. <laughs> Calming, became super aware of my breathing, more aware of my breathing, deep valleys, high peaks, entangles, connected with my body. Oh, zentangles, yes, I'm familiar with those. <clears throat> Relaxing. Yeah, and I and I saw start with high peaks and then change, right? So it's a nice visual graphic that we can really see and track our breath. It's very difficult for a lot of people to um, sit with their eyes closed and focus on their breath. And I know that there's a lot of really creative ways to help kids practice, you know, meditation 
uh, and breath meditation is just one exercise or one type of exercise to cultivate mindfulness. Um, and it can be very difficult for, for not just children. I see a lot of adults too, um, where they don't feel like they're good at it. <laughs> um, they have a lot of internal chatter. It makes them feel anxious. Um, and so doing this type of activity is like a doing, non-doing, doing, right? It kind of bridges the world between not doing and just focusing on the breath and doing something that I can really trace and track and pay attention to. So it can help us to pull in our focus a little bit more tightly. Thank you so much for all of the comments coming in. I'm going to um, talk a little bit about practicalities now, right? Let's get practical. I love being <laughs> practical. I always tell people that I work with when they come in and I'll give them a suggestion or whatever. And then I'll say, now tell me all the reasons why that won't work. Because I'd rather problem solve that now than have you go, oh, that's a great idea, Erica, and then leave and go, yeah, I'm never going to use that, <laughs> right? So again, this is a, be a perfect time to put Q&As um, in if you have any practical application questions um, in addition to what I'm going to be sharing with you right now, right? So <clears throat> the first thing is just using it, right? I mean, to get really practical means, okay, I'm just going to make a commitment to using it. And to think about if you're somebody who likes to be very planned and feels more comfortable being planned, especially if it's a new skill or a new tool that you're using, or if you like to be more spontaneous and if you feel like you would be more inclined to use these activities if you just said, you know, I'm just going to use it sometime today and I'm just going to surprise myself and just decide on a whim to do one of these activities, right? So being intentional with ourselves about how am I going to support myself in bringing this into the classroom, right? Um, once you get more familiar with and comfortable with the use of these activities or similar activities sort of creative based uh, mindful activities, then you can start to use both, right? Think, I'm going to plan this. I'm going to make this part of a ritual. This is going to be what we do after lunch every day to help transition back into the classroom. And I'm going to use this other tool in a crunch when the class is getting squirrely and they're getting loud and we need to just whoo, re refocus, right? And so you can think about ways that you can do both, right? The next is to identify those barriers, right? To start thinking for yourself, what might get in, to, uh, in my way? And those can be external barriers and internal barriers. It's interesting because I am a board certified art therapist. I do art therapy supervision. Um, you know, I talk to a lot of art therapists and a lot of art therapists, um, you know, who like, this is kind of like their jam. Like even they sometimes are like, yeah, I, I'm not bringing art into the room, right? And so we look at internal barriers like, oh, like I, it feels like a lot of work or it feels like, I don't know, like we were just kind of talking about this thing and we were just in our groove. And so I just didn't want to interrupt the flow or a lot of times with educators, um, barriers, internal barriers can be um, that concern about like losing your students. Right, like if they get creative and maybe they get too creative, they're never coming back. Like, how are we going to contain this? And that's a really important piece to keep in mind. Um, so things like small pieces of paper can be helpful, right? That can help create that containment. Um, using a post-it note is very different than rolling butcher paper across your floor and say, "Okay, everybody, let's make mindful mountains on the butcher paper." If you do that on butcher paper, you're much more likely to have a hard time getting your students back, right? To refocus, to move on to their lesson. So those are things to think about. How can you create enough structure for yourself and in the classroom? You know, is it going to be a song that signals the end of the activity and then we're gonna transition? And this sort of gets into transitioning creatively. Are we going to draw mindful mountains, put down our pencil, and then we're gonna make a mindful mountain with our hand that's gonna then reach in and grab our math book and put it on the table, right? And so we can think about these ways to move inside, into and out of um, the creative activities. And then keep materials on hand, right? And again, I'm hoping that most of these activities, you'll say, oh yeah, I got those materials. That's, that's a no brainer, right? But for some people, in in some schools and some classrooms, that is something to be aware of. Um, and so having something that you can grab quickly, pass out if you need to. So we're going to do another activity now that actually I'm going to give credit to my 13-year-old son for this one. He did this drawing in the left-hand corner. Um, 
he was um, having a rough time one day and kind of taking it out on everybody, right? Challenging behaviors, right? Signaling something going on on the inside. Um, and, and I just sort of said like, maybe you wanna go draw. <laughs> so he went and he was drawing and this is what he, he drew. Um, and I, and I was looking at it and I thought, gosh, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like when you write like journal, you know, like everything going on in your life, but he did it through doodling. And so I started thinking more about this and how I can adapt it to, to my work. So this is something that a child just spontaneously did out of need. Um, and I thought, goodness, that could help a lot of other people as well. Um, so the doodle dump, right? And so talking about containment, right? Sometimes it's enough just to say, okay, we're going to doodle dump. And once still children know, knows, excuse me, I'm tripping over my words. Once children know what that means, it'll just become secondhand. Let's doodle dump, right? So that just essentially means dumping whatever is in your head or in your feelings onto a page, but that could feel very overwhelming. So this is that piece about containment that I'm talking about. So we can use a post-it note. You'll see that on the bottom here of the screen. Um, once we doodle out our thoughts and feelings, we can fold the paper physically and then you can collect it or they can stick it in an envelope and staple it. So there's a lot of physical ways that we can help students to feel more contained, get it out and then let's contain it, right? So that we can also transition. Other ways to create containment would be to draw on the piece of paper or invite the students to draw a shape, right? Such as a heart, that's a little light, but it's just a heart shape or draw an oval to represent the brain, right? <clears throat> and that we can just dump out all the thoughts um, or dump out all the feelings if we're using a heart. We can get even more contained by specifying what we're dumping out about. So let's say that there's a test coming up or a quiz today, right? We're going to dump out all of our feelings or thoughts about this quiz, and then we're going to fold it up, and then we're going to write something that's positive or reassuring to ourselves, or just write good luck or do your best, and then we're going to pass that up, right? And then maybe teacher even reads some of those um, positive or encouraging words before the test begins. So again, wanting to give you a lot of different ways to adapt these activities for your own use. So let's go ahead and just take a minute right now to doodle dump, all right? So you can think of something specific if you would like to. Again, think of something that, um, you know, is maybe on your mind. It's been, and it doesn't have to be something stressful or bothersome. I know sometimes that when I check in with my thoughts, there's a lot of thoughts going on in there. It's like, I got to be there. I got to do there. Maybe there are thoughts about what you need to do after this webinar. Um, and sometimes just getting all that out and then taking a step back and looking at everything, we can get some, again, some new insights into um, what's going on in our mind. Okay. So I'm going to give you a moment again, if you would like to draw a heart for feelings, if you'd like to draw an oval, or if you're really artsy and one draw brain, you can, but it's not necessary. <laughs> and just taking a moment to dump out your thoughts, feelings, or both. And you can use shapes, you can use squiggles. They don't have to be pictures. They can be words. Right? And I think that that's really useful too, to keep in mind that those of, um, those of us who are uncomfortable or don't feel good at art, even though we're trying to remind students this isn't about making pretty art, this is just about, you know, communicating in a different way and getting stuff out. And, you know, sometimes that judgmental piece will sneak in. And so giving those options to say, you can squiggle, right? You can pick different colors and dump those out. Those can represent different thoughts, different feelings. There is no right or wrong way. And similar to the de-stress uh, scribble on scramble, if a child is stuck or if you're feeling stuck right now, you can start by simply scribbling how crowded it is in your head or your heart. And maybe it's not very crowded, but again, it's another invitation to check in, right? That's that non-judgmental awareness of the present. That's that mindfulness piece coming in, right? 
And so a lot of times we'll hear from students, well, I don't know, right? That might be a question that you have. Well, what do I say if they say, well, I don't know. I don't know what to draw. And that, what I say to them is, you know, one of the things I often say is that's okay. You don't need to know. This comes from a not knowing place. And sometimes that permission just frees them up enough. Oh, well, in that case, that happens a lot with the adults that I work with. They go like, I don't know what that feeling would look like. Yeah. And I go, that's okay. You don't need to know. It comes from a not knowing place. Oh, in that case, it's like blue and spiky. I'm not sure why, but it's kind of goopy and it's sitting next to me, right? And so it kind of frees up the imagination. And they still don't know. That's where you can then say, well, would you like to just start by scribbling how crowded it is in there? Right. And once we have an art image to work with, we can start talking about the image on the page and not talking about the child. And that can also give some distance and help kids to feel freed up to put something on the paper. So what I mean by that, and I don't know if you caught that or not, but I, I said, you know, would you like to start by scribbling out right on the paper or how crowded it is in there? Right. I didn't say how stressed out you are. Right? But if we have a heart or we have an oval to represent the brain, like how crowded is it in that brain on that paper? How crowded is it in that heart on that paper? Right, That objectifying, that distancing, right? Like, oh, well, I can show you how crowded it is in there. We're not talking about me. That starts to feel safer, right? All right, so inviting you now to use the chat again. I gave you a little bit of time to do your doodle dump and experiment too. Go ahead and fold it up. If you would like to, you don't have to, but see what that's like, if that feels containing or not, or to put it someplace that you would like to put it, turning it over, um, experiment with that, just so you also get that felt experience of, okay, I've done this, now how am I going to contain it? Drawing a border around it or a picture frame, right? Taking post-it notes and covering up the images with post-it notes then, and then writing something. There's lots of different ways we can be creative with this simple activity, All right? So I'm gonna check the chat bar now. If people would like to share a couple mm -hmm. words about what that process was like. Yes, you can use words as well. Um, what I often um, encourage is that um, if people are using words, um, to consider the font of the word and the color. Um, they don't have to, um, but that adds that sort of extra dimension of, um, of, of the meaning of the word to them, right? <clears throat> because somebody might wanna dump out a thought about homework and they write homework. Right? Well, is that homework in pretty cursive with flowers? <laughs> or is that homework in block letters with, you know, cobwebs <laughs> on it? Um, so, um, so, yeah, so absolutely can use words. All right, taking a look at some of the other comments coming in. Um, great moment to say a kind word to yourself. Yes. Uh, let's see here. Just scrolling through the comments. Um, if you do have any um, concerns, I just want to sort of speak to uh, number five here on the instructions on the doodle dump. Give children the option to discuss their drawings with you or not, right? For your purposes as educators, um, you know, we're working on sort of resourcing and building resilience and calming. And, and if a student starts to become unwound by one of these activities, maybe something unintentionally comes out or they feel triggered by something they drew. Um, just remember your resources, refer out, um, redirect if you or if you see something concerning in a drawing. Um, you can speak with the student after school maybe or on a break and say, hey, I'm wondering if you would be willing to tell me a little bit about your drawing. Tell them, you know, I'm wondering about this. I'm curious about that, right? Without interpreting it, because sometimes what we see or think we see is not necessarily what the meaning was that they had behind it. So when we talk about art, important to just be very neutral and not interpret, not, um, hey, why is this 
guy stabbing this other guy, but instead I'm wondering what um, you, you drew here. Can you tell me the story about your drawing? Um, and if they don't speak to the certain area that you're concerned about, then you can say, this part's really getting my attention. I'm wondering if you can share a little bit about what's going on here. And then again, know your resources, refer um, to the school counselor if you need to, um, get a consult if you need to. Um, all right. On. So this is our final activity for this evening, uh, the tree tracing. Now, you can do this with nature. There's so many added benefits to looking at nature, even if you're indoors, if you have a plant or plants, um, going outside, being with nature if possible, um, even a little bit of nature, like weeds coming out of the cracks of the sideways. There's a lot of research around um, the mental and emotional and physical health benefits of being with nature, paying attention to nature. Um, so that's why in this particular activity, I made it centered around nature. But by all means, if you're in the classroom um, and you just wanna give students the option to trace anything that they would like to, feel free to. So I'm gonna go ahead and not speak a lot about this in advance, but instead I'm just going to go ahead and facilitate it. And I'm gonna facilitate it as if I was doing this in a classroom of students. So we have 130, you're, you're my classroom of 137 people right now, plus those who are gonna be watching on YouTube. Um, so I have a very large classroom right now. Um, and of course, um, it's I can't monitor the room. I don't know how everybody's doing, which will be a big benefit from you for you, right? Whereas I'm just kind of flying blind here. Um, but what I'm going to do right now is we're going to take a little bit of a mindful minute break, a little mini mindful break today. Um, and so I'm going to invite you to get your drawing or writing utensil and your paper ready. And I'm going to invite you to look around the classroom right now and see just something that catches your eye. Just something that you're kind of like, huh, like I like that, or I've never noticed that before. Okay, so take your time, look around, I'll look around with you. All right, and then when you find something, land your attention on it, all right? So you're gonna focus your attention on that object now and start to get kind of curious about it. Look at the colors and the textures, right? We're gonna kind of put on our artist's mind now, right? Artists look at objects like they're seeing it for the first time, right? In mindfulness, we call that beginner's mind, right? Even though we've probably walked past that can of pencils a hundred times, like for this moment, right? Or that plant or whatever it is that you're looking at, right? For this moment, just get really curious about it. And then our challenge is going to be to draw it without looking at it, all right? So this might feel a little stressful for some of you who want to really see what you're doing, but just try really hard to keep your eyes on the object. And we're going to put our drawing utensil on the paper, and we're going to keep our eyes on the object, and we're not going to lift up the pencil. We're going to keep the pencil on the, uh, on the paper as we're starting to trace our eyes around the object. We're gonna move the pen or pencil along with wherever our eyes go. So we can think of it like tracing, like tracing the object, except for we're looking at a real object instead of putting, you know, tracing paper on top of a drawing to trace. Okay, and keep going until you get all the way around. And then you can move your pen and sort of do some of the details. So for um, art students who are familiar with this word or older students, you can give them sort of the, the verbiage around a contour line drawing, right? That we're creating the contour of the object with a line. And as you're doing this, just notice what happens on the inside. Just notice what happens in the mind, what happens in the body what happens to sensations, emotions, right? And then whenever you're done, you can look at your paper and have the big reveal. <laughs> now at this point, especially with kids, there's a lot of laughs, right? Because the drawings look pretty silly, right? So this is an activity I mentioned before, some people get anxious when they can't look at the paper, 
right? That's why I said, try not to, right? You might, it might peak. You're not going to get in trouble if you peak, right? Um, but that can cause some anxiety. And you can speak to that as well. If this made you anxious, like that's okay, right? Because maybe it's information for you. Like what were the thoughts telling you? Were you worried that you were going to make a mistake or that it was going to look silly or it wasn't going to be perfect? Did you feel like you didn't have enough control over the drawing, right? So those are all things to pay attention to just in terms of internal thoughts. And we can guide this a little bit more during the activity or before and say, if you're having thoughts about it's not going to look good, remember our strategies. We can say, thank you, brain. And I'm going to keep drawing this plant because I'm going to have a silly drawing to, sh to share with people, right? So we can use that rehearsing that reassuring self-talk, right? So again, you can use this intentionally as a planned activity to start the day or to shift gears between activities. You can likewise do this activity with no materials at all. I'll actually do this sometimes if I'm in the car and it's, you know, I'm on the way to work or it's maybe been a stressful morning. If I'm on a stoplight, I'll just sit there with my eyes and just trace around a bush. <sighs> and then typically I whew, take a deep breath. I'm present again. I feel a little bit more grounded. My mind clears and then I can go forward, right? So we can use it to reset and to refocus. So we're going to be transitioning into the Q&A before we do that. And as I show my last slide, I'd like to invite people again to share one, two or three words about what this activity was like for you. I'm just gonna share a little bit about my contact information. Here's my website, therapywitherica.com. I do have a newsletter. Um, it usually comes up quarterly if I have the energy <laughs> to put it out that, that often. And sometimes if I have something coming up like this, um, you know, I'll send out an extra one, but there's the link there, subscribe.therapywitherica.com slash connect. And you can follow me on Instagram at Erica K. Curtis. And thank you again, everybody for being here. Um, I'm going to take a quick look in the chat before I transition over to Q&A with Darcy. Um, fun, silly, enjoy, great activities. Oh, some emojis. <laughs> seeing emojis come in. Yeah, that's a whole nother workshop. We should do a whole one on just on, on reactions on Zoom and emojis. <laughs> yep. Um, classroom plants are so great for mindfulness and just setting the tone of the space. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much. And feel free, everybody, to continue to read the comments as they come in. I'm going to pass it over to Darcy to read off some questions. Yeah, so we have a couple, and I did grab one from the chat that I, I'm going to revisit too. Um, but one question we have is, what grade levels do you recommend for each of these activities? Are there some that work better for kindergartner versus eighth grader or something like that? Is there Are there any um, best recommendations for each of these activities? Yeah, I appreciate the question. And it's, a, it's again, a practical question, right? And it's important to, to understand sort of the practicalities of these. I like to say that these are good for ages two to 200. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I joke with a colleague of mine, um, who is actually the co-author of, of our first book, The Innovative Parent, um, who uh, actually had sort of a, a, an exchange with her husband, and she has given me permission to, to share this, um, this story, but her husband sort of used one of these, you know, used a, a, an art-based stress management tool kind of <laughs> with her, and she like, de you know, like she felt better, she felt more connected, and she was just laughing about it, saying like, yeah, you know, we always tell people that like any age, you could adapt these tools to any age, and she's like, and it's really true, and it really made me feel better, um, and so I, my hope is that because you're all adults and you've experienced yourself and a lot of you did experience the benefits that you could feel, wow, even as adults, I, I benefited from this. Um, you know your class, how you adopt or adapt the wording, I think is the most important. If you're doing this with a six-year-old, then a 13-year-old, then a 17-year-old, you're going to language it a little bit differently. Um, and I tried to today also show examples, like here's an example for my six-year-old, here's an example for my 13-year-old, not because Mindful Mountains is for six-year-olds and Doodle Dumps is for 13-year-olds, but just to show the range that any of these activities can be used with any age. Yeah. Awesome. 
Um, and then we have a question about um, transitioning students from these activities into mm -hmm. the work. I know you mentioned one earlier that was like, and move your hand down to the book. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but do you have any other tips of how to sort of transition from these activities into classwork or things yes. that are, you know, you have to do? Yes. So, you know, some of those containment strategies, like now we're going to fold this up rhythms. I'm already, it, that was interesting. I started going into a rhythm already. Rhythms can help, right? We're going to fold it up, especially with the younger ones, but even older ones, you know, they, they do like rhythm and clapping with little ones and then they stop. And I'm like, why do they stop? Like it helps. Yeah. I remember stuff with rhythm and clapping, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? So, you know, and it's containing too, right? That's containing. It's self-regulating when we are in rhythm together, right? And so it helps us also to connect and bond with the teacher to get that attention. So we're going to now fold it. We're going to fold it up. We're going to pass it up. We're going to carry on with that rhythm now while we get out our pencil and our English book, right? And so you can use a rhythm to close out and activity and transition to the next because that becomes the bridge, right? And that's, I think, the, the general principle is thinking about what's the bridge, not, okay, now we're stopped. Okay, stop everybody. Now we're done, stop. <laughs> now we're gonna do math, stop, right? There's no bridge. And so creating a bridge either with that movement, right? We're gonna mimic that movement and move into this. We're going to create a rhythm and move into this. We're building those bridges. I think also, again, making sure I hesitate to say making sure, trying your best to keep the activity somewhat contained. Um, you'll notice all of these activities are, are really pencil paper. Those are containing materials, right? Um, you're not going to expect a lot of containment with finger paint, <laughs> right? Um, which is why we don't say, okay, let's bring out the paints, right? right. Um, <laughs> um, for something <laughs> like this. We, so the materials are already intentionally very containing. We talked about the size. I did have an intern one time say, I tried this. I don't know why they, you know, like I could not get them back focused again. And I was like, okay, what happened here? What happened here? What happened here? Well, it turned out she had used butcher paper. So they had moved into this gross motor ac activation of their bodies where they're, they have big movements and that big expression is much harder to contain, right? So when we have smaller expression plus that bridge, it's easier to transition. Awesome. Well, I am going, because of time, I'm going to go ahead and end right there. Um, any questions that we didn't get to, I will definitely pass them along, and we will try to reach back out to those of you who asked them. Um, so thank you, Erica. Thank you and, so much. This has um, been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much. So thank you, and thank you for everyone, or to everyone, for joining us today. Um, I hope you found this webinar useful. I'm sure Erica feels the same way and that you'll join us again for future online speaker series sessions. All right. Thank you again for attending and have a great evening.